Before we begin talking about cellular transport, I want you to think about what you've learned about cells. You have a cell membrane that is the barrier between what's inside the cell and what's outside the cell. Within the cell, you have the cytoplasm, which contains the juice, which is the cytosol, but you also have all the organelles and the inclusions, and of course, all the really busy work of the cell takes place in the cytoplasm. And then you've got the nucleus where the DNA is housed, right? All your genetic information. So if you've got a boundary between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, how do you get nutrients from the food you eat? Well, the nutrients go into your digestive system, but it has to get out of the digestive system and into the cardiovascular system, into the bloodstream, right? And the blood's got to carry those nutrients all throughout your body. And then it has to get into the cells so it can get to all those little organelles in there and do work, right? So in order for nutrients and hormones and waters and electrolytes and all the stuff that we need to get into cells, it has to take a part of an action we call cellular transport which uses the cell membrane and its characteristics to get things into and out of the cell. So we're going to talk about the way things move and whether things are moving from where there's more to where there's less or in some strange cases whether things are moving where there's already more to where there's already less. So I want you to think back to when you were young and perhaps you were dying Easter eggs and you took those little Easter egg dye pellets out of the package you got at Walmart and you put them into a container of water. And when you first put that dye into the container of water, all your dye was in one place. Now this is showing adding a liquid dye, but it's the same idea. You start out with all the blue stuff in one area. And then after a few minutes, the blue starts to move all through the water and even more after more time has passed until you wind up with all the water and all the dye the same all throughout that solution. Well, you had to have dye particles move from where there was more dye to where there was less in order to reach that equilibrium. So that takes us to the first thing we're going to talk about and that is how things are moving across that selectively permeable cell membrane which allows some things to move and other things can't. What does passive mean to you? Passive means no resistance. So if I push against a door and it opens easily, there was no resistance. Didn't take a whole lot of energy for that to happen. As a matter of fact, if we're talking about moving things across the cell membrane, it takes no energy at all because things move from where there's more to where there's less. But if there's resistance, that requires energy, right? So if we're moving things in the opposite way that it wants to normally happen, that's going to require we use energy. So that's going to be active transport. So in passive transport, we're going to see four different examples of that that require no energy. Simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, and filtration. Now, I mentioned using energy. What is energy? The ability to do work, right? What's the energy molecule that we as humans use? A, T, P, adenosine triphosphate. Passive transport requires the input of no energy. Active, think active, right? That's work. So that requires the use of energy. It requires us to utilize stores of ATP and to make more ATP. So a solute pump, vesicular transport, including endocytosis and exocytosis. What's a pump? If you're going to pump air into a tire or pump water out of your boat, that requires energy. And vesicular transport, think of that as packing things in a suitcase and moving them from point A to point B. Well, that requires some energy too. So let's get started first looking at our mechanisms of passive transport. So diffusion, simple diffusion, is the movement of a solute across a cell membrane 
along a concentration gradient. Now remember, you've learned about solutions. So a solute is what is dissolved in the solvent. So for instance, if you have salt water, water is the solvent, solute is the salt. Okay, same thing if you've got sugar water. Sugar is the solute, water is the solvent. So your body wants to maintain a certain equilibrium, but we don't always have an equilibrium, so things have to move from where there's more to where there's less, as long as it can easily diffuse across that membrane. Now that's the same thing with the example I used a while ago showing you the dyes. The dye was in one place and over a period of time you had dye particles move until you reached an equilibrium. Well if we have a whole lot of little green hex or little blue hexagons on one side of our cell membrane and none on the other so here in the extracellular fluid, you see we've got a whole lot of these little blue things. We don't have any on the inside, so there's more, there's less. So the movement of these little blue hexagons across the cell membrane from where there's more to where there's less to reach an equilibrium, that's the way some things move in the body and that's called simple diffusion. So it's moving along a concentration gradient and that's the driving force for that movement because equilibrium strives for getting things the same. So these are things, these are solutes that can pass through that phospholipid selectively permeable cell membrane moving from higher concentration to lower concentration. Now this is a non-selective process so it's not little blue hexagons can get across but little purple ones can't but it is based on the size of the molecules so the molecules have to be small enough to move across the membrane and also the solubility of the solute so some things can move across the lipid membrane because they're lipid soluble and when lipid meets lipid it becomes one great big old lipid right so if your cell membrane is made of lipid and you have a lipid based molecule that let's say there's more lipid based molecules in the extracellular fluid than in the intracellular fluid those lipids are going to meet that lipid membrane and cross that membrane to get in it's very much like if you were um, thinking about solubility and, and cell membranes if you were boiling spaghetti noodles and you decided you wanted to put some oil in your water before it started boiling when you first put that oil in if you look down at the surface of that water look into your pot you see hundreds of little bitty drops of oil floating on the surface oil and water don't like to be together right so oil is what we call hydrophobic it doesn't like water so if all those oil droplets can group up together some of them can get away from the water I know it sounds like a nightmare story, right? Horror movie. Get away from the water! All right, so when those oil droplets get together, because oil meeting oil merges together to make one big oil. Now that's in a pot of noodles, right? Or a pot of water. But you have water inside your cell. You have water outside your cell. Oil is a lipid. So the oils, the lipids in the body are going to try to come together and when they do they become one big lipid. So your lipid based molecules just fuse with that lipid cell membrane and then the contents of course uh, and some of the, the molecules will become inside the cell. All right, facilitated diffusion to facilitate means to have help something happen so sometimes things can't get across the membrane sometimes they can so facilitated diffusion is the movement of a solute across that membrane with the help of a protein now remember when you learned about cell membrane structure you saw that there were some transmembrane proteins that ran from the intracellular environment through the membrane to the extracellular environment. So here we've got little purple balls going through just simple diffusion. Perhaps they're lipid soluble. Perhaps they're really small. Doesn't matter. They don't need any help. 
They move from where there's more to where there's less. Here we've got little orange triangles. Now little orange triangles can't do like little purple circles. They have to have some help. So, but they still want to move from where there's more to where there's less. So there's a channel protein here, which allows little orange triangles to move from outside the cell where there's more to inside. So this channel is facilitating the movement of those little orange triangles. Here we have, again, little blue circles, more outside than inside the cell. So the concentration gradient is what's driving this movement, trying to get everything to equilibrium. But this is not a, a channel. What happens here is when these little blue circles bind to these protein carriers, they change shapes. So it's closed, the carrier is closed until the little blue circle binds to it, and then it sort of grabs that little blue circle and brings it in. Now remember, I'm using little purple circles, little blue circles, little orange triangles. Those are your solutes. That's something that there's more of that solute outside the cell than in, so it is moving from high concentration to low concentration. So this is very, I'm sorry, Whoa, let's get back where we were. This is going to, my mouse is very touchy, guys, I'm sorry. This is a very specific type of movement because the blue circles can't move through the pore, the, uh, the channel, and the solutes that are the orange triangles can't move through the carrier. So it's a very specific recognition that allows these solutes to move. But remember, the big idea here is it's not simple diffusion, just gets across the membrane. It's facilitated. These solutes must have help. We want to talk about osmosis, but before we do, I want to point out the difference in osmosis and diffusion. So we saw simple diffusion and we saw facilitated diffusion. In both of those cases, the solutes were moving from where there was more to where there was less. So here you can see solutes moving from where there's more to where there's less, which would be out into the container, until you reach equilibrium. Same thing here in this diagram. You have a high concentration of solutes, low concentration of solutes, and as long as those solutes can get across that membrane, then you're going to reach equilibrium on each side of that membrane. But what if the solutes can't pass? Will we ever reach equilibrium? The solutes can't move. Osmosis allows us to reach equilibrium, same concentration, across the membrane when the solutes can't. When the solutes can't move, the water can. So let's look at the second part of the diagram here. Okay, we've got a whole lot of solutes on the right side of this container. We have a lower number of solutes on the left side of the container, but the membrane won't allow the solutes to pass. Water will always move across cell membranes. We want equilibrium in the body. So what happens instead of the solutes moving, because they're they're not able to, the membrane won't, is not permeable to them, the water's going to move instead. So the water from here is going to move to here until we reach equilibrium. This is how water moves around in your body. If you're sweating, you're losing tissue fluids, right? Well, what happens? Water moves from your blood out into those tissues and you become dehydrated, right? When you become dehydrated, then your brain's going to be triggered for you to drink water. So let's say you go and get a drink of water, and now you've got water in your digestive system, but your water in your blood is low because you moved it all out to your tissues. What do you think is going to happen? I knew you got it. Osmosis is going to allow that water, drive that movement of water from your digestive system now in, out into your blood until we reach equilibrium. Man, I'm telling you, the human body is so cool. All right, so the difference in osmosis and diffusion, diffusion is the movement of the solutes 
from higher concentration to lower. Osmosis is the movement of the solvent from one place to another from where there's low concentration of solute or to the low, um, I'm sorry, it's the movement of water from where there's more water to where there's less water because you had a higher concentration of the solute. So water moves to reach that equilibrium. All right. So that's what I just told you. Osmosis is the movement of water through those selectively permeable membranes. Concentration of um, the, the solutes is the driving force. Water is sucked from one place to another. So I often tell my students in class, osmosis sucks. What does it suck? It sucks water from where there's more water to where there's less water. So if the solute can't move, the solvent does. Now let's think about what we just talked about in relation to the tissues of the body. So tonicity refers to the ability of a cell to maintain its water balance. Okay, Iso means same. So isotonic, think of it as the same concentration. So your body cells are in fluids and you have fluid inside your cell, you have fluid outside your cell. So if you have an orange body cell in blue tissue fluids, okay, and in the fluids of the tissue, so this is extracellular, you have 0.9% sodium chloride. And inside the cells, you have 0.9% sodium chloride. Then that is known as isotonic solutions. Iso is same, okay? So remember, osmosis is the movement of water from where there's more to where there's less. If the solutions are isotonic, then what do you think happens? Does water move in the cell? Does water move out of the cell and into the tissue fluids, into the extracellular fluid? Well, you might be thinking, well, it's the same. So neither side is going to lose water, which also means neither side is going to gain water. So now, nah, don't guess water moves, right? Wrong. Water does move, but water moves into the cell and out of the cell. The cell doesn't gain water, the cell doesn't lose water because there's no net movement. Water constantly crosses cell membranes, but because the solutions are isotonic to each other, neither inside the cell is gaining or losing or outside the cell is gaining or losing water. So iso is same. A hypotonic solution Hypo is under, so the solution is less concentrated. Okay, so 0.5 sodium chloride is less concentrated than 0.9 sodium chloride. So this outside the cell is a hypotonic solution. So now if we're looking at concentration, does 0.9% have more water or does 0.5% have more water? Well, the one that has the most sodium chloride has the less water, right? So we have more sodium chloride inside the cell. We have more water outside the cell. Can you guess what's going to happen? You can if you know osmosis because water moves from where there's more to where there's less. So water moves from the extracellular fluid into the cell and the cell swells up like a great big old water balloon that you put too much water in and the cell membrane can rupture and that is what we call cell lysis. So the cell is rupturing. And that takes us to the other side of the coin. Hyper means over, more, too much. So a hypertonic solution is more concentrated. Okay, so inside the cell we still have 0.9% sodium chloride. Outside the cell we've got 2% sodium chloride. So less than 1% as compared to 2%. So if we're looking at concentration only, 
outside the cell in the extracellular fluid, 2%. Inside the cell, 0.9%. So by concentration, which has more water? Extracellular fluid or intracellular fluid? Correct. Inside the cell had more water by concentration. So water is going to leave the cell and get into the extracellular fluid trying to reach that balance, that equilibrium. Well, that causes the cell to shrivel up and that's what we call crenation as the cell is shriveling up and losing water, becoming dehydrated. So a hypertonic solution causes cells to crenate. Now let's look at what happens to blood cells. If you've been to the hospital and you get an iso or you get an IV, well, under most conditions, they're almost always going to give you an isotonic IV solution. The reason for that is so that the concentration outside the cell, your body cells, is going to be the same as inside your body cells. So red blood cells in an isotonic solution, water goes in, water goes out, no net change. But what if you got a hypertonic solution? Let's say you've got 0.9% sodium chloride inside your cells and someone hangs that 2% sodium chloride solution. What did we see was happening? The water was moving from inside the cell to outside the cell because the concentration was higher of sodium outside the cell. Your cells want to reach an equilibrium. So in a hypertonic solution, water is going to leave the cell and the cell will crenate, shrink, dehydrate. And here you can see what's happening, right? So in a hypotonic solution, what's happening? Water is moving from outside the cell into the cell, and that cell can burst. So that's what we call lysis, okay? Now, did that require any energy? No. We simply had water moving from where there's more to where there's less along a concentration gradient. So we're still looking at passive transport. And the final mechanism of passive transport I want to talk to you about is filtration. So we looked at osmosis or osmotic pressure driving the movement of water a while ago, but hydrostatic pressure also drives the movement of water. Anytime you see hydro, think water. So I put that first image up there to get your brain thinking about filtration. When you make a pot of coffee, what do you do? You put coffee grounds in a filter and water runs through it. Now, what do you want in that pot? You want a nice, smooth coffee. You don't want all those coffee grounds in there. So when the, the coffee or when the water is running through, the coffee stays in. The coffee grounds stay in. Because the, even though you may not see them, those coffee filters have teeny tiny little holes called pores. So they're so small that the coffee grounds can't get through, but the water can. And some of the chemicals, some of the molecular components of the coffee beans and the coffee grounds gets down in there as well. So you get that yummy, wonderful nectar of the gods, right? But what causes that water to move? Have you ever watched when your coffee is being made? And when the water first goes on into the filtration unit, man, that water is flowing through so quickly and your coffee is running so quickly and you think, oh, it's only going to be a few seconds and I'm going to have my cup of coffee. But think about it. There's lots and lots of water in that filter and it's pushing hard against that filter because there's so much water. The pressure of the water is hydrostatic pressure. But as that filtration continues, and there's less and less water in that filter, what happens to the rate of filtration? It starts to slow way down. And you wait, and you wait, and wait for those last few drops to hit, right? That's because the hydrostatic pressure decreased, okay? So, how is that applicable to the human body? Do you have filters in your body? Of 
course you do. You have filters everywhere. Things filter across cell membranes. One of the easiest examples to relate to that making a, co a pot of coffee is to think about the way your kidneys filter your blood. The role of your kidneys is not to make urine. The role of your kidneys is to filter the blood. And they do so in these little ball-like structures. And this is just a piece of it you'll learn more about later. So when blood comes in through this little network of blood vessels, it's carrying all kinds of waste products. And it's carrying excess water and hormones and all kinds of stuff. And it's pushing against the walls of this little capillary bed. So the higher the pressure of that blood, made up mostly of water, remember, the higher that pressure pushes against that little filter unit right there, the more filtrate comes out. So high blood pressure can increase the rate of filtration. Low blood pressure causes less filtrate to be pushed out. And this filtrate is going to go through a long tubular process over here that's eventually going to end up in the toilet. Now there's a whole lot more to it than that because we have to keep some of that stuff that goes through the filter unit. But that's how urine is formed in the body. It's driven by hydrostatic pressure and that is what forms urine. All right. Now let's talk just briefly about active transport. Active, remember, requires energy. So this is moving molecules in, in the human body against, not with a concentration gradient. So that means we're moving things from where there's already less to, or from where there's less to where there's already more. That's going to take some energy, right? I mean, if you think about pushing something uphill, that's going against a gradient. So this dude pushing this great big old boulder up the hill, you can bet he's using some energy. So active transport moves things from where the concentration is lower to where the concentration is higher. Again, against a concentration gradient. So sometimes when I'm talking about this in lab, I mention boats. So let's say you have a boat and you've got it parked in the bay and you forget to put the plug back in. So water starts flooding into your boat from the bay. Now, what's happening there? The water is moving from where there's more water to where there's less. Well, that's sort of like osmosis. We've seen that already. That didn't require any energy. Water just moves from where there's more to where there's less. But I don't think you want to let that get to equilibrium, right? Because if it does, that means your boat's underwater. So what do we do about that? we've got to pump that water back out because it's not going to just flow back from where there's less to where there's more. We've got to use energy to get the water from where there's less to where there's more. And you can bet there's more out there in the bay than fills your boat. So what kind of energy do you use? Well, you can take a bucket and you can scoop the water. That requires energy. That requires your energy, ATP. Or you can turn on your pump. That requires energy, electricity, or gasoline. But either way, in order to move something from where there's less to where there's already more, that requires energy. So ATP can be used to power pumps in the human body to move things such as sodium and potassium from where there's more to where there's less. And it sometimes does so by changing the shape of those carrier proteins so that it can move substances across the membrane, such as our sodium potassium pump that I mentioned a while ago. Now, I don't want you worrying about remembering all the steps of this. You're going to get more of this later. But for now, what I want you to see is here's your sodium potassium pump. ATP is being used to change the shape to move sodium and potassium from where, where there's more to where there's less. It requires energy, adenosine triphosphate. Uh-oh, one last slide. Now, vesicular transport is also, just like sodium and potassium pumps, it is also active transport. Remember, active requires energy. Now, this particular image doesn't show where the ATP is being used, but the, this is a process that is driven by ATP. Molecules have to be taken inside the cell, 
wrapped in a vesicle, which is like a little bag, transported across the cell, and then perhaps used or perhaps sent out, like taking out the trash. So let's look at what's happening here. We have little green balls. Again, don't care what they are, they're solutes. We want to move them inside the cell. So when these little green balls hit the cell membrane, they can't cross. So we start folding the membrane around them, creating a container. That container is going to surround the solute and bring it inside the cell. So that is known as endocytosis. Now, once those solutes are inside the cell, we use them for whatever job that solute is needed for inside the cell. And then we transport them across the cell in the vesicles, which are little bags of membrane, remember. And then in many cases, we need to get rid of that solute and perhaps waste products. So the little vesicle gets moved to the outs or back to the membrane of the cell. And remember, it's made of membrane, lipid meets lipid, fuses together, and exocytosis of the contents of the vesicle occurs. Now, endocytosis brings things into the cell. Transcytosis moves uh, things across a cell, little green solutes in this case, and exocytosis allows things to be taken out of the cell. And when solid particles are moved into a cell, that is called phagocytosis, and we sometimes call it uh, cell eating. When liquids are brought in, that is penocytosis. So I often tell people, remember, phagocytes are cells that eat. Pino, think of Pinot Noir or a Pina Colada. Either way, you're drinking it and bringing it in. Eat cell condition. Drink cell condition.